classified documents from the UK's Defence Ministry have been found at a bus stop in southern England, with notes in them about how Russia would react to the British warship that sailed near Crimea, sparking an incident with Russian forces. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. Now, you may have heard of the dodgy dossier, but have you heard of the soggy dossier? A top secret 50-page document belonging to Britain's Ministry of Defence, found behind a bus stop of all places by a member of the great British public. It reveals that Britain knew all along that sailing a Royal Navy warship off the coast of Crimea would provoke Russia, but did it anyway to avoid looking scared of that tough guy president, Vladimir Putin. You'll remember that Russia described the incident as a dangerous provocation, while the British said it was all a storm in a teacup. Question is, who's telling the truth? Please change your course to starboard and keep clear, keep clear. Hands fracture stations, hands fracture stations, it's Take your seat straight away. It is a slightly more increased threat, I'd say, just because we're operating outside of our normal areas. And you're being watched by the Russians? Uh, they can see us, we can see them. If you across the border line, I'll be fired. If you don't change the course, I'll be fired. Do you hit me over? Official low. Tensions have escalated between Russia and the United Kingdom on the seas off the coast of Crimea. Russia's defence ministry says a Russian border patrol boat has fired warning shots at a Royal Navy destroyer and a Russian plane has dropped four bombs in the path of the ship in the Black Sea. If the Russian version is true, this would be the first time since the Cold War that Moscow has actually acknowledged using live ammunition to deter a NATO warship. And that's what Russia says. The United Kingdom has denied that its warship was fired upon by the Russian military. We believe the Russians were undertaking a gunnery exercise in the Black Sea and provided the maritime community with prior warning of their activity. No shots were directed at HMS Defender and we do not recognise the claim that bombs were dropped in her path. It's, it's quite an unusual situation here. We've had Russia saying that it had fired warning shots and Britain saying, no you didn't. Now what should be pointed out here is exactly where this took place. HMS Defender was sailing just off the coast of Crimea, which Russia annexed from Ukraine in 2014. Crimea's waters are not recognised as Russian under international law. The sovereignty of the waters around that area um, are disputed. What was your ship was doing uh, in our territorial waters? Tell me, please. These are Ukrainian waters, and uh, it was entirely, entirely right to to use them for, to go from A to B. Well, it's always plain sailing in Boris Johnson's world, isn't it? And now his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, is trying to look equally casual. Вот вы сказали, что мир стоял на грани мировой войны. Да нет, конечно. Даже если бы мы потопили этот корабль, все равно трудно было бы представить, что мир стал бы на грани третьей мировой войны, потому что те, кто это делают, знают что они не могут выйти победителями из этой войны. Well, quite a provocative statement there. Let's bring in our guest now. And Tom Sharp at the top left is a former Navy commander with over 20 years' experience at sea. Alessio Patalano is a senior lecturer in war studies at King's College London. Alexander Titov is a Russia specialist at the University of Belfast. And finally, we're joined once again by the China analyst Ina Tangen who is in Beijing. Thank you all for joining us, much appreciated. Uh, Tom Sharp, I'd like Thank to start you. with you. I'd like to start with those very, very recent comments in the past hour or so from uh, Vladimir Putin, saying that uh, we're nowhere near a World War III scenario, even if they'd sunk the HMS Defender. Uh, basically, Britain wouldn't dream of starting a war because they're far too powerful, R Russia's far too powerful, and Britain and the rest of NATO couldn't even win it. He's trying to dig straight to the to the thing that, of course, everyone else is is trying to avoid, which is exactly that situation that escalates quickly into a conflict uh, uh, of sorts. Uh, of course, 
um, we wouldn't want to go unilaterally to into a conflict with Russia. Um, and, and he's he's probably right. Nor could we. But therefore, missing the point, which is which is operating as part of an alliance, operating as part of a, a coalition, uh, and showing that strength with our allies is exactly the reason for doing it. I mean, there has been a communications to and fro throughout this um, that he has the, has had the last word. It doesn't surprise me hugely. Yeah, Alexander Titov, why would uh, Vladimir Putin make that sort of remark? It seems to be uh, vastly exaggerating the incident in itself and then even thinking about a World War III and, and uh, anticipating a victory for Russia just seems a little immature. Well, I think um, I was watching the, uh, his uh, press conference today. What he said was, what was said is that uh, there was a direct question, were we on the brink of a third world war with Britain over uh, its sailing of its ship through the Crimean waters? And Putin said, no, nowhere near that. Uh, uh, even if we sank it, um, there would be no third war because um, uh, no, everybody knows that we can't, you can't win a nuclear war and Russia is a nuclear power. Basically, that's what he said. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's kind of uh, he, he, his remarks. Uh, essentially, um, uh, kind of <laughs> almost coming things down uh, in his own way because kind of in Russia there was a lot of um, uh, outcry and um, uh, about this latest incident. So he kind of uh, being um, a sort of sanguine uh, statesman about it okay. in his own way. Uh, Alessio, you're uh, studying you know, war studies or rather teaching it at King's College London. So have you ever thought about what Putin has uh, postulated there, which is what would have happened? Uh, obviously, this is way beyond the incident itself, but what would have happened if the defender had been sunk? Have you ever thought about what would follow from that? Um, of course, um, these are the sort of situations that one spent a lot of time thinking about, particularly since the incident um, has, has it's developed in terms of information available to the wider public over about 24, 48 hours. So one quickly has to start to grapple with this question. But I think perhaps it is worth reminding, before thinking about an hypothetical sinking of, of, of a major surface combatant of a foreign country, um, that perhaps this is part of a distraction, um, a, a distraction from what the main point is, and that is that HMS Defender, uh, through its innocent passage, was reinforcing the point about the importance of the matter order and how normative powers need to act in order for the existing order to remain as such uh, and avoid that negative situation by which, by not making a point about it, uh, you have a de facto change in practice, which is extremely important. So I think part of it is that distraction element from the critical question of maritime order. And the other element is just to reinforce the domestic narrative of a chest-pumping, fully in control president. So I think that's perhaps where we should pay our attention, you know, where we should pay the focus of our attention rather than on the hypothetical of a sinking of warship, which frankly would have been rather more complicated than Putin makes it look it to be. Aina, I'd just like to get Beijing's perspective. When they see uh, these sort of encounters around the, around the waters around Crimea, are there any lessons that Beijing takes uh, from what, what has happened? China is looking at this as a possible template for uh, US or other country action in the South China Seas, and they're gauging what they would do. Um, they're not probably going to be as aggressive as Putin has been. Uh, he doesn't have the same kind of pressures. China's economy is doing quite well. Russia's is not. Uh, he co is coming off a, uh, a very, for him, a very good uh, summit with Biden. Uh, he's been able to show that he's an equal. Uh, he, the Russian people have responded to him in the past as a strong man. And I think that's really what's behind this. I don't think uh, reading into this that he intends to start a third war, world war or anything like that is useful. No, not at all. Um, Tom Sharp, can we just address the incident? Uh, most people will be familiar with it by now, but can you just uh, show the difference between the way Russia reported it and the UK reported it? It's very difficult to track the chronology of the incident from, from start to finish, particularly who fired what and, and in what relationship to the, to the vessel. When did the Russians book the firing area that they claim to have done, and, and so on and so forth. So I think the the real, the real point for me in all of this, because it, it flared into a, into a war of words um, quite aggressively and then died down quite quickly. If we, if we bring ourselves back to the bridge of the warship, 
uh, then it would have been fairly interesting on there because it's very, very hard to tell uh, what's a dummy attack, what's a threat, and what's a what's a real attack. And actually, the range at which those the Coast Guard vessels were operating, and in particular the uh, the aircraft, were well inside what would have been comfortable for the destroyer if they had thought it, this was a proper attack. So you, they would have been on high alert. Uh, they would have been on high alert on sailing. They would have known this was uh, likely to happen. Having correspondence on board would have certainly affected their their, their metric as they sailed um, from from Odessa, mm -hmm. and thereafter they would have just been responding to what they see. But as I say, the time difference between a dummy a dummy run and an actual attack is 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 seconds. So you've so got to be if, very if, very sharp. If you were commander on the defender, what how would you have acted? Well, I'd like to think I'd have done it as they did it, which which seem, seemingly was very calm. But if a Russian Coast Guard vessel is yelling at you on the radio uh, that he's going to fire and then you hear ordnance, you're going to have, like I say, you're going to have the eyes down uh, at the highest state of readiness in case this turns into something else or, or in case there's a miscalculation. And I think that's never, never, uh, should never be underestimated. And like what? what? Give us an example. Well, someone's firing ordnance just to stern of you and they hit you by mistake. Yeah, uh, or what an about aircraft. buzzing? What about aircraft buzzing by the, the ship itself? So the aircraft buzzing very, very close. I mean, they could they could potentially hit you if they're if they're low enough. That's that's unlikely, but has happened in the past. Uh, or you just get an itchy trigger finger. You finally you get intelligence, or something else changes, and you think this is the one. This aircraft coming towards me now. He's not responding. Uh, he's flying an attack profile. This is the one, and you press you press the trigger. And you're talking about milliseconds of decision-making time here. So they were very cool. I think the ship handled it right. extremely well. Mm. Uh, Alessio, we'll get into the differences uh, on the account, the war of words, um, as Tom mentioned. But first, just the incident itself. Uh, we've got all the video. Uh, what was the most striking part of that video evidence for you? Um, how the Russian Coast Guard was struggling to keep up with the HMS Defender, uh, which, which, which connecting it to the broader question of how does that reflect um, in a potential South China Sea situation is actually quite telling. In the South China Sea, you would have a 3,000 ton um, a Coast Guard cutter capable of keeping up with the destroyer and therefore exercising a degree of restraint out of confidence, control and, and sheer capabilities. There you saw a situation that, as Tom correctly pointed out, um, was tense predominantly because you have a relatively smaller ship that is trying to keep up and, and you are unsure the extent to which they know where to draw the line in terms of sending a strong message and actually engaging, whether intentionally or by mistake. So for me, that was one of the most striking things. And as Tom said, um, the HMS Defender crew, at least, at least from what we've seen, was composed, was calm, uh, orders were distributed very clearly, and that fraction of seconds makes all the difference. Uh, that's where professionalism kicks in. And that's one thing that is striking about everything happening and that we've seen is that the British were fully professional and in control, the Russia not so much. Um, is it the case that Russia has overall the more powerful military uh, than Britain, but that Britain's navy is not that far behind or perhaps comparable? I think that actually the opposite is true. I mean, we're talking about, particularly when it comes to, to, to maritime capabilities, uh, uh, seamanship, handling, the, and the quality of the materials, uh, Britain is far ahead. I mean, let's not forget that HMS Defender is part of the carrier uh, strike group, CSG-21, that is currently deploying for six months. Um, it's deploying with one of the most advanced carriers available in Europe. Um, it's operating together with allies in ways that we haven't seen since World War II. Uh, we have actually USMC F-35Bs embarked on board as part of the air wing of the carrier. You've got the elements of the carrier, the submarine, the destroyers, uh, that are at the cutting edge of technology. The Russians will never be able to do something like that, not even on the best day. So here what we're talking about is like two quite different situations and professionalism matter in the small uh, uh, in the small detail, um, in the small print that makes a difference of the day. And unless you, you've mentioned that it's, this is, the incident is one thing, but the war of words, in other words, how it was reported by the two sides is another. Uh, point out the differences and just explain the motivations behind that, please. So I think the war of words actually was very interesting because it started as a, as a, as a very sort of typical Russian info op trying to take uh, advantage um, of the situation. 
uh, linking the uh, hastily organized uh, 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 fire drilling exercise, uh, the buzzing of the planes and the Coast Guard chase um, as a way to indicate that Russia displayed force in a place that control and chase the British away. Uh, but then you see the information coming out from aboard of the ship uh, through BBC and then MOD statements that clarify why the ship is there. Um, for enforcing and maintaining uh, uh, international law as we know it and as it is practiced. Mm -hmm. So an innocent passage through territorial waters, a straight point A to point B. Um, and then from then onwards, I think the infobs started to turning against the, the Russians because as the information became available, the Russian position not only became untenable, but also started to speak about uh, dangerous and unprofessional behavior, which of course might play well with the domestic audience in Russia, but internationally just leaves the Russians damaged and perhaps less capable next time to deploy efficiently and effectively their info operation activities. Alexander, um, why did the, the Russian side, the Russian account, seem so much more serious than the, the British account of the incident? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. There's kind of several audiences they uh, addressing in terms of uh, Russian domestic audience, but also the uh, the international one. So for Russia, it's sort of it's maintaining its sovereignty, and for uh, international one, kind of um, um, uh, again projecting its um, uh, its its sovereignty over Crimea. Um, uh, I would say that uh, you know the British account it also sort of has. Um, um, kind of changed, evolved, uh, and uh, you know we know now from the from the leaks that you know the, it was um, uh, the deliberate uh, um, uh, policy of, because they, had, they were considering two different routes. One kind of more safer, the other one is uh, more kind of in the Russian space. Mm. So they, you know it was a political um, uh, statement as well by by the British. You know with the context of you know calling into Odessa before signing a, a big arms contract uh, with Ukraine. Uh, and also the issue of, of course, uh, of uh, innocent passage. Uh, it's um, uh, it's kind of different from, as far as I understand, from uh, kind of uh, establishing uh, you know freedom of navigation, right? So that's kind of different. Uh, innocent passage, anybody, regardless of uh, whether it's Ukrainian or you know Russian territory, you know everybody has a right uh, for for that route. Russians chose to escalate. Uh, mm. uh, uh, because uh, it's kind of to reinforce their lines. Uh, but the British themselves were also, you know, quite deliberately choosing to um, uh, go in a, in a safe way. They were, they were kind of right on the international point of view. They had the right to sail through those waters. Yeah. But mm. at the same time, they also chose deliberately to make a political that, point. That's interesting. So I mean, that, that is probably borne out by this um, soggy dossier that was found uh, by a bus stop in which they yeah. said, you know, there are various scenarios here, some of them... Uh, could be a bit hairy, and that one of them, you know, the, one of the statements within that dossier is that, you know, we know this is going to provoke Russia. Mm. And, of course, so the BBC got a, got, got a hold of that dossier. Uh, they also had a journalist on board the Defender. Is anybody on this panel uh, putting these two things together or a bit concerned about... You know, we talked about Russia and misinformation and information. I know you're chuckling there. Yeah, yes, I am. I mean, this was a, a very deliberate uh, provocation. I mean, uh, there's a lot of pressure at home on the domestic politics, uh, both on the health and economic sphere. It's For not Boris Johnson above, or Vladimir Putin? Uh, any nation, <laughs> any nation to uh, just simply use this as a diversion tactic. Uh, both sides, as we can hear, are talking about chest thumping jingoism. Um, you know, uh, my navy could beat your navy. I mean. Gosh, are we back on the uh, on the on the playground again? Unless you come uh, in. These. Uh, no, I was, I was listening. Um, I, I was listening very carefully, and it, it seems that we, we need to be careful with words we use. Uh, I mean, HMS Defender was just sailing uh, in the fastest, uh, most expedite and direct line that connects the port where they're wearing and the port they were heading. It so happened that is an innocent passage in territorial waters, but that shouldn't be a problem to anyone. And um, so the fact that this escalates, I, I think we have to be careful uh, to uh, divide the two subjects here. The action itself, which is perfectly legitimate, legal, and in principle shouldn't at least an automatic response. So it leaves an element of agency on Russia to decide what to do with it. And the fact that the soggy dossier proves that the British government was actually considering what kind of options and, and uh, possible actions could come out of Russia and correctly estimated that the Russian would probably react, if not overreact. Now, going back to the original question that you asked, is there any connection there? 
I have to say, uh, you know, uh, if one has ever watched an episode of, of Yes, Prime Minister, or indeed in the thick of it, you yeah. get that that a proper leak is an essential element of the working of government in the UK. Um, and I think, you know, whether this was accidental or not, um, the key point is that the BBC had the dossier on Tuesday. Uh, the incident occurred on Thursday, on Wednesday, so the day after. And presumably, it's it's logical to expect that, that Jonathan Beale, the correspondent on board, probably had an idea of what to expect. Yeah. That made it possible to create very good reporting and, and in a way preempted what eventually ended up being an attempt at an infobs that turned out really badly for the Russians. OK, could we take a quick look at what's going on in the South China Sea, a far more important theatre, perhaps a maritime theatre? Um, we know that uh, China claims all of that area as part of its territory, and you've got uh, the likes of Vietnam, Philippines, and Malaysia uh, disputing that. And of course, from time to time, uh, some confrontations, shall we say, do happen. U.S. military aircraft, Papa Air Alpha, leave immediately and keep far off so as to avoid any misunderstanding. Well, that's footage from a U.S. Navy plane which was flying over an area in the South China Sea back in 2018. As you can hear, the Chinese military not exactly happy about it. Uh, they were perhaps even. Uh, more cross when the Filipino military did something similar. Philippine military aircraft, I'm warning you again. Leave immediately, or you will bear for what is the ability for all the consequences. Uh, I know, with regards to China's claims over the South China Sea, um, who else but China recognizes that? Uh, Taiwan, uh, they have exactly the same uh, claims. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, uh, when you talk about these claims, uh, if you take all of the other nations, uh, all except Malaysia, have four claims against each other. That means, in addition to China, they have claims against each other. This is a highly disputed area. Even if the nine-dash line wasn't there, there would still be disputes. So, at this point, China believes that it, uh, when it joined UNCLOS, that it, it put in a domestic law saying, and they caveated that they would, uh, only, they would adhere to historical, what they termed historical uh, precedents in terms of control of those seas. So you have an impasse here. Uh, in close was all started by the United States because we wanted to enlarge our territorial uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and maritime wise, uh, that led to a series of events and now here we are uh, squabbling over what is what and who belongs to what. Tom, Tom if you were in the South China Sea patrolling, um, you would have to take any Chinese um, presence very, very seriously indeed. They're much more powerful than uh, Russia, in, in the water especially. Mm -hmm. They are, and the situation, I, I believe, sort of from an operational perspective, is more complex because of the number of competing uh, elements. I, I said right at the start of the of the Russian incident, it was actually very straightforward. One mm. ship, one nav track inside the 12 miles. It was it was pretty clear. And yet, e even then, the the information overtook the event to the point where people didn't quite know what was happening. If you put that in the in the South China Sea, um, the American U.S. military have a planning expression um, called "first with the truth," uh, and it's the ability to get to what's just happened. So. HMS Defender and, in fact, the entire strike group, when they're in that area, need to be very, very sure where they are. Uh, and I know that sounds um, straightforward, but the, but the spoofing and the GPS activity uh, prior to the Crimea thing suggests that this, this, this data can be manipulated. So you need to be very, very sure where you are in, in relation to lots and lots of different claims. So there will be dotted lines all over their charts. Oh. And they need to be very careful with that because there'll be more nations involved. And if something like this happens, if there's a, a scuffle, as there was recently, then, then the confusion will, will escalate very quickly. And that can lend itself, lead to, to other problems. Alessio, interestingly, and this is a, probably a final question for you, but uh, the, you, you're saying that the Chinese, it's less likely to blow up as quickly uh, with the Chinese because if it does happen, it gets very serious very quickly. Uh, it does, and it also it's a script that everybody kind of has, has been aware of. I mean, let's not forget that since the early 2018, uh, the Royal Navy has had almost uh, uh, consistently and persistently, except for a month and a half, um, a, a surface combatant that deployed in the region. Uh, that's that's been a very important development to allow to create a basic uh, institutional understanding and, 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 and memory, if you want, what it means to uh, deploy and operate and patrol um, in the Indo-Pacific region, and in particular in the South China Sea. 
Let's not forget also that in 2018, HMS Albion conducted um, a, a challenge of excessive maritime claims around the straight baselines concept applies um, around the, the, the parcels. Um, and so that also uh, contributes to the wealth of experience that the Royal Navy has been dissecting uh, and, and tried to um, sort of take on board in preparation of CSG. CSG, CSG is going to be a much more complicated deployment because of the number of ships and the type of assets. But at the same time, it has also more um, uh, engagement activities. So the point that Tom was making is absolutely right. The, the Royal Navy will be very careful the, 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 the spots and the dots that they, they're navigating. But at the same time, it will be interacted with a lot more partners. And there will be clarity if or when um, any sort of specific type of activity in sailing related matters uh, takes place. Alessio Patalano, Tom Sharp. Alexander Titov and Ina Tangen, thank you all very much for your contributions, much appreciated. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do check out our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye.